my kids and my husband and be there with them through this hard time tomorrow. It's my stepdaughter's burial, and I don't even get to be there, and I'm accused of doing something that I never would have done. This child was suffocated and left brain dead. Six years later, he died. Today, I have two silly cows who took the lives of their stepchildren. I'm going to start with Melissa and Memma in May 2003 in Michigan. She was caring for her fiance's two-year-old son, Tyler Court. She severely attacked him, tied his hands behind his back and pushed his face into a doggy pillow for at least two minutes. And you may ask yourself, why would she do this? Well, because he was misbehaving. After the child lost consciousness and stopped breathing, Melissa did not immediately call 911, but instead called a friend. When Melissa did call 911, she was advised on the importance of administering CPR. Melissa half-heartedly administered CPR, if at all. In fact, the dispatch operator told police that there's no way Melissa could be doing the CPR but then talking to the operator at the same time. Melissa's friend likewise indicated that although Melissa was attempting to administer CPR, she kept stopping and never continued for very long. And then when emergency personnel arrived, Melissa was not performing CPR on Tyler. You see, she exhibited a complete lack of conscience and compassion. Melissa's friend, as well as the medical personnel and the police detective, all said that Melissa never expressed any concern about Tyler or inquired about his injuries or prognosis. Rather, Melissa's primary concern was about her boyfriend being mad at her. In fact, before Tyler was taken to the hospital, Melissa kept asking, what's going to happen to me? What's going to happen to me? Now, in a recorded video interview, she told Detective Terry Hogan that Tyler was being upset and Tyler was not listening to her and he climbed the dresser. She admitted she tied his hands behind his back with a pillowcase and placed him on a bed to show him the effects if he fell off the dresser and broke his arms. Let's look at that one more time. You know if you're going to tie someone's hands behind their back, use a rope. You can use a towel. Who thinks I'm going to get the pillow, take off the pillowcase and use that. For, to have that kind of elaborate thinking in my mind, this was pre-planned. Maybe not the method, but harming this child was pre-planned. Do you agree? The detective said she gripped the back of his neck and smothered his face into a doggy pillow. She denied putting a bandana in his mouth. But DNA testing found Tyler's saliva on a bandana in the house. After the incident, she tried hiding the items. The police said they contended Tyler was an easy target for her to take out her frustration toward her boyfriend, a situation she no longer desired. In the video, she said, I am stressed. I love Tyler to death, but he's not my son. I don't want the responsibility of watching him. She did say she disciplined Tyler by tying his arms behind his back and placing him on his stomach on a bed in an upstairs bedroom. So after this incident, Tyler survived, but his brain stopped growing. He was left in a vegetative state and became paralyzed. This meant Tyler required around the clock care. So he didn't die, but essentially he was brain dead, so to speak. So in 2004, Melissa was convicted of child abuse. It wasn't murder, it was attempted murder. And following a trial, she was sentenced to 25 years in prison. Tyler, in the years after the incident, lived with his grandmother Deborah. And there was some allegation that she did not really care for him. There were some petitions put forward to court. These petitions were for failure to feed, failure to clothe, and failure to protect. But what's important is that being in a vegetative state means that you go to sleep and awaken regularly and your eyes open and move. But typically, you have lost all capacity for thought and conscious behavior. What kind of way is that to live, eh? And if we fast forward to December 26, 2009, Tyler, six years later, in this vegetative state, he died from his injuries. The police were notified on December the 26th that Tyler had died and he was about to turn nine before he died. 
the medical examiner ruled that it was as a result of the abuse that was inflicted by Melissa. Police indicated the boy was being taken care of by his paternal grandmother when he died and that he had suffered lung damage and possibly some paralysis from the injuries he sustained from the abuse. He was doing fairly well considering for a while, the policeman said, but he was deteriorating. After being notified that Tyler had died, detectives reopened the case and presented the file to the prosecutor's office to charge Melissa in his death. Remember initially child abuse, but now that he died, well it's a murder charge. Prosecutors then authorised a two-count warrant against Melissa for felony murder and premeditated first-degree murder. The charges were on top of the sentence Melissa was already serving and on November the 9th, 2011, her 25-year sentence was changed to life in prison. And in 2004, at her sentencing hearing, she said, I am sorry for what I did to Tyler from the bottom of my heart. I didn't mean to hurt him. This will haunt me for the rest of my life, no matter where I am. Well, that's pretty obvious you're going to be in prison, you muppet. Tyler's parents and grandparents did not attend this hearing. They just wanted to put this behind them. The prosecutor, speaking on their behalf, said, they don't want to experience this again. And the judge, Peter Macaroni, he said that how can anyone be pleased with any of this? Yes, they put it behind them, but nobody can be pleased. A young healthy boy who had everything is killed and a young woman is now in prison. What I also find quite sinister is that Melissa's mother, Valerie, she blamed Anthony. Anthony is Melissa's boyfriend. She said it was his fault for placing his girlfriend in a stressful, negative state of emotion. Huh? What? How's it his fault? She also pointed to arguments in the trial that Tyler's grandparents, Deborah and Anthony, who were caring for Tyler, provided insufficient care. This was kind of important because there were some children they were caring for who were taken away from them because of neglect. So there was an argument that maybe Tyler died because of the lack of care, but the medical examiner said, no, 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 this is because Melissa abused him. And why did she do it? Because she hated Anthony, her boyfriend. And everything she felt for him, she took it out on the child. Instead of actually being an adult, instead of actually using her brain and confronting Anthony and either telling him, fix up, whatever the problem is, or telling him, I don't want this anymore, she was too weak and she took it out on the child. She did not want the situation anymore. My guess is she was probably thinking, man, I got to take care of these kids and Anthony's not here leaving me. These guys are doing my head in. I didn't ask for this. This child isn't mine. Remember, this was her stepchild. Either way, life in prison, fair result. She deserves it. Nothing more, nothing less. Now we'll move on to the second story. Renee King killed her two-year-old stepdaughter, Lily, in 2010 in Michigan. Then, a few hours later, after she made the 911 call, emergency personnel arrived at her home. They discovered that the child was dead. Medical evidence indicated that the child had multiple contusions on her body, including at least 20 different areas of bruising to the head. Here's my question to you. If I fall and you see that I have 20 bruises, are those bruises because I fell? Or do you think these bruises came elsewhere and the fall is just another bruise? Let's keep going and we can figure it out. The medical report also said that Lily had a serious injury to her genitalia area. But before we get to the actual incident, this entire story goes way back to 2007. Lily's father, Jeffrey, meets Lauren, who's Lily's mother. Jeffrey and Lauren never got married. Their romance in 2007 only lasted a couple of months. Lauren got pregnant and she was too scared to tell her parents. Then a few months later, the couple split up. By the first custody hearing in July 2008, where Lily was three months old, Jeffrey had married Renee King, a woman he'd known since high school. Now Michael Higgins, who was the judge in this custody hearing, made it clear that he believed in joint custody and intended to award it. Higgins called Lauren obsessed with her daughter and he objected to her interest in sole custody. He suggested she drop out of Central Michigan University. He told her, you should have adopted a baby without a dad, that's what you should have done. You had a baby with this man and now you're devastated? I'm sorry, that's too bad. Get used to joint custody. Now, it was in 2010 when Lauren and her parents Frederick and Lynette, they became suspicious 
that Lily was being physically abused. There was a mark on her neck that looked like a burn. She also had a black eye. However, Renee and Jeffrey explained it away. Lauren at the time wanted to call the authorities, but she was afraid that she would lose her daughter. Also, Jeffrey and Renee's relationship was far from perfect. You see, six weeks before the murder, Renee sought a personal protection order against her husband and the child's father, claiming she was in fear for her own life. She said at the time, I don't ever want him to be around me so he can put his hands on me again, citing physical abuse. She requested for protection order against her husband, but this order was denied. It had been filed one day after he filed for divorce from her, a move he later dropped. Jeffrey at the time said that the everyday pressures of marriage and holding a family together is one of the reasons why it broke down and why he wanted a divorce. So have a look at this environment for the child. Jeffrey and Lauren, the parents, they're fighting for custody and didn't really get on. Then Jeffrey and Renee don't really get on anyway. It's not the ideal situation for the daughter or for Lily. You see what I mean? Jeffrey at the time said divorce is an ugly thing no matter what the situation is and he filed for divorce on October the 7th claiming there was a breakdown of the marriage relationship to the extent that the objects of matrimony had been destroyed adding there was no reasonable likelihood of a reconciliation and it was a day later on October the 8th when Renee applied for this protection order claiming her husband had assaulted her and was stalking her at her workplace and residence. She also said she refused to have sex with her husband during a camping trick, so he bent one of her fingers backwards and struck her back in retaliation. On other occasions, she claimed Jeffrey had thrown items at her including a cup, bowl and telephone. She also wrote about Jeffrey coming to her mother's home and retrieving a gun that he had left there, which obviously had her worried. She claimed that Jeffrey was insulting and intimidating and she needed to stay away from him. Interestingly, in her case file, it was revealed that she, Renee was previously married and in that marriage she had three children. Her husband Joel also had an order against him. She also filed a protection order against him. Make of that as you will. Jeffrey denied ever hurting his wife and eventually she moved back in with him with her three children. Now I'm going to get to the murder. So on the night before, on November the 19th, 2010, Lily went to her father's home for the weekend. She helped decorate a Christmas tree in the corner of the living room at her grandparents' home. Now on the day of the murder, the next day, Renee's version of events was that she was taking a shower with Lily. Then she fell on Lily when her knee gave out. This is why I asked you earlier, if I fell and had 20 bruises, is it because of that fall? Or is it other stuff? Well, in this case, she's claiming, oh, I fell on Lily. That's where all the injuries come from. Renee did previously sought medical treatment because her arm and leg had temporarily become numb. She became hysterical when the child did not wake up and splashed her face with water in an attempt to revive the girl. Jeffrey said he was at work when he received a phone call from police telling him that his wife and daughter were at the hospital. Now, at the hospital, Renee had several question and answer sessions with both medical and police regarding her stepdaughter. While she waited to be medically cleared and interviewed, she started feeling agitated. The police department informed her that she could not leave until she was medically cleared and they needed to be notified before her official discharge. At the hospital, Renee agitation grew and in a moment of frustration, she tried to leave and remove her IV. The police officers who were present at the emergency department told her that she needed to be detained. So the question remained, how did Lily get all these injuries, all 20 of them, from just a fall? Also, where do these injuries to her genitalia come from? Well, the medical examiner determined that the child died from cardiorespiratory arrest as a result of the head injuries and classified the death as a homicide. Renee claimed that the child's injuries were inflicted accidentally. One of the main issues at trial was whether the trauma was inflicted deliberately or whether the victim's injuries were accidentally caused. Unfortunately for Renee, she gave conflicting accounts of the falls. The prosecutor was allowed to introduce evidence that Renee had previously struck the child in the face deliberately. 
And the reason for this is because this evidence made it somewhat less likely that she accidentally injured the child in the head, given her previous abuse. Authorities believed Renee used multiple objects before using an unknown object to strike her in the head, which eventually killed her. Chief trial attorney Therese Tobin said the number and severity of blows to Lily's head and harm to her gender should convince jurors that they should convict Renee of felony murder, as well as first degree child abuse and first degree criminal sexual conduct. He went on to say, the sheer volume of these injuries, the sheer impact of these injuries will show her intent. The devastating blows to her head caused hemorrhaging to her brain, bruises to her skull. Now Renee's defense attorney Jason Malkovich told jurors Renee has consistently insisted she did not intentionally hurt the child but dropped her twice due to her bad back. Renee took Lily to the bathroom to clean her after she vomited. Then her right leg gives out and Lily falls. She remembers three distinct sounds of Lily hitting the walls and the side of the shower. Then while running to the telephone to call 911, she dropped Lily again. Jason did acknowledge that dropping Lily twice seemed a little odd, but explained that Renee had been falling due to back and leg problems, including numbness. To help Renee's claim, eight days before the incident, her doctor scheduled an MRI that never took place due to her arrest. Jason attacked the police investigation, accusing New Haven officers of immediately focusing on King as a criminal suspect, believing claims of prior abuse by Lily's biological mother. Jason, the defense attorney, said New Haven police did everything to try to disprove Renee King's story and did nothing to find the truth. He also mentioned that Jeffrey and Lauren had disputes between them, therefore Lauren was incentivized to tarnish Renee's reputation and that she would do anything to obtain full custody. The prosecution also had another theory. They said that a frustrated, drug-influenced Renee repeatedly shook Lily's head against the floor. In retaliation to the girl twice defecating in her underwear and having temper tantrums, said the district attorney. Renee had been complaining to others about Lily, and during her closing arguments in the trial, the district attorney said, Two-year-olds aren't easy. Two-year-olds have accidents. Two-year-olds have temper tantrums. Two-year-olds act up. The price that Lily paid that day, she paid with her life. Lily was having temper tantrums and Lily pooped in her pants, that's what set this time bomb off. Tobin contended that Renee was affected by prescription drugs for anxiety, depression and back pain. Renee was in fact diagnosed with a bulging disc in her back. Tobin argued that Renee gave inconsistent statements to police, pointing out more than one dozen conflicting comments about the incident. She said Renee cleaned up the scene and Lily before dialing 911. In contention, Jason Malkowitz, the defense attorney, he said in his closing arguments, Lily only suffered two severe impacts to her head that were caused by two falls in the bathroom. They had a defense expert witness, Beda Kassin, who was the Wash Tino County Medical Examiner. He said Lily suffered the vaginal injury from landing on a bathtub or shower ledge or faucet. However, to counter this, the prosecution's medical examiner, his autopsy showed that 20 injuries to the child's head were consistent with having a knock to the floor over and over again, the same kind of trauma someone would experience in a car crash, and the injuries to her genitalia were comparable to what a woman would experience giving birth. The prosecutor said an object was used to assault the toddler, though exactly what kind of object was not revealed. Now, the jury did find Renee guilty and sentenced her to life in prison. And it was during the trial that Lauren, the mother, got her first and only chance to confront Renee. This is what she said. As I will never see Lily's first day of school, first date, first prom, her graduation, her wedding, her children, neither will you. I get to have more children someday and I get to hide Easter eggs. I get to get my daughter married, dress for her wedding, my son for his wedding. I get to do all the things that you don't. You decided to take my world from me that day. So when you sit in front of a camera after Lily was killed, asking if you could go to the funeral and crying because jail was too hard. Just wait, Renee. You have a whole life in prison. Have fun. As you took my life away from me, being her daughter, the justice system took your life away from you. The point that Lauren was making to Renee was that you still have three children. I can go have more children. I've lost this one, but I can have more children. 
but I'll see them grow up, I'll see them get married, I'll see them graduate, you won't see a goddamn thing. So my conclusion is, the first story Melissa, just a moron of epic proportions, hated her situation and wanted to get out of it but she was too weak, she was stuck for whatever reason, she took it out on the child, spend your life in jail, don't you ever come out. As for Renee, nice try with the um, fall but 20 wounds, mm -mm. medical examiners are there for a reason, sit your ass in jail, you are never getting out. Thank you for watching.